All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Hurley Investments Market View Commentary for Monday, the 11th of 2021. Today actually is one of my little brother's birthdays. Craig, happy birthday. Glad you made it another year. <laughs> With that said, I've got a couple things of interest I wanted to go through with today. So today I have three things of interest for today's market. Uh, first, let's go through trades. Trades, I'm going to call, also call it the new opportunities. So if we're looking at the market and we're looking at uh, the market right now, what sectors seem to have new opportunities in them? And I could think of two, but what sectors seem to have new opportunities in them? And there could be more, but I'm trying to see about uh, what you think. So perfect, I love it. Uh, it came in as finance. Finance, and that's related to higher interest rates to make a bigger spread to make the finance companies more money. That's really what it comes down to. Nothing more than that. It also could come down to or... If the finance companies are lending their own money, they can make a higher interest rate fee from that, right? It's really that simple. What's the second one? Or what could that second one be? Abraham, great job on uh, the finance. Bingo. And it's a uh, good job, Jim. It's tech slash commodities. Now, commodities are going to be a little interesting, but usually what it comes down to in a higher interest rate environment, tech usually outperforms. Anyone know why? Why does tech usually outperform? Why would tech usually outperform in a high interest rate environment? I can think of two reasons. But why does tech usually outperform in a high interest rate environment? Any idea? Why would technology outperform in a high interest rate environment. Oh, I don't see anyone answering anything. Because I'll be honest, sometimes we hear um, tech leadership is threatened by higher interest rates. Higher interest rates will affect mega caps in their purchase of commodities. Sometimes you'll hear that higher interest rates make profits less. More opportunities for services needed, I'll buy that one. But 
Any other thoughts before I tell you my thought? All right, so let me, companies are compelled to be more efficient when money is expensive. It could be that too. So typically in high interest rate environments, you're looking at financials that are going to benefit from higher rates through increased profit margins. Brokerages will see an uptick in, tr in trading activity. And then you usually will see industrials, consumer names, and retails can outperform when the economy improves, and that's why there's higher interest rates. But usually, if you were to ask me why tech outperforms, tech already purchased the materials, is service-driven, and most importantly, already borrowed slash um, procured their capital at the lower interest rates. I mean, most tech companies are already like, hey, fund me and, you know, go fund me and we'll, we'll get running on things. So, Today, Keeve and I are talking and going through some things, but today, some of you will notice a new position. And that new position looks like this. Have it in here somewhere. Screenshots. We are in a 160 covered call. So right now we have covered calls that are worth $11.08. We have a stock. already trading at let's see where did you guys go i lost you there you are all right so we want to get out, oh, come on, Hurley, type. Get out of positions this year for tax reasons, right? Want to make sure you pay our 15%. Pretty neat to have an overall cost basis at 95. We're going to get called out at $60, which means right now for earnings on Wednesday morning, we have a $6.64 buffer. Our covered call is an $11.08 credit. So are we going to run protection for... JP Morgan, we are not going to add protective puts because we are $6.64 in the money with an $11.08 credit, which equals... Uh, let's do the math there. It looks like uh, $17 and 
72 cents of downside protection. We feel we're covered. Now, if we get called out at 160 in December, 160 with an $11.08 credit, it's like getting called out at $171. $171 minus 95. It's like we get called out at a $75 profit. We look really good. But what about some of us that can't afford JP Morgan? And how about the fact that we still want to be invested in JP Morgan? For that reason, we entered 90 new contracts at $19.98. Currently worth $19.57. So we're already down. Oh, 41 cents, 41 and a half cents, 40, 40 and a half cents, I guess would be a better way to say it. But between now and January 23, meaning, or 24, excuse me, we have all of the rest of this year, all of January 23, all of January 24, for higher interest rates to compel JP Morgan higher. For $19.98, or to put that into some pretty pretty simple, $19.98 divided by a cost basis of $166.64, for 11.9% of the value of the stock, we can own the right to buy JP Morgan at $175. Between today and the third week of January in 2024. Anyone remember how many interest rate hikes are expected next year? Uh, Abraham, I'll hit your question in just a second. I'll make a comment on your on your question or your your statement in just a, just a second here. Any uh, idea how many rate hikes we're expecting in the next year? The consensus is two, possibly three, and the consensus of 2023 is possibly three as well. So we have somewhere between five to six rate hikes, which rates so low at a quarter percent, we move them up to one and a half percent. It's like increasing the spread by 600%. Here we have the opportunity for banks to make a, quite a bit of money. Does anyone think JP Morgan might trade at least $9 higher than where it's trading today, two years and three months into the future? I, for one, would say yes. And what's helping me make that decision? It really comes down to looking at the charts. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull JP Morgan out two and a half years. Hit a low 135, 2020, pretty ugly year for banks. It's starting to move higher. And in all honesty, if you go from March till October, it's pretty much been sideways, just now breaking out to the upside. Last time, it just broke out to the upside. It went from 100 up to 140 or a 40% increase. If you haven't noticed, last year, October till the end of the year, 30% run to the high side. Uh, again, October to the end of the year, 
a 60% run to the upside. We, we're just following what Bank of America typically does. We're following a pattern. The pattern seems to be intact. So for those of us that can't afford JP Morgan at $166 a share, we're dabbling with some leap long calls, giving ourselves two years and three months for JP Morgan to trade roughly uh, $195 or higher, guarantees a profit. If we add a 30% run on 166, 166 times 1.3, it gives you a target price of 215 by the end of the year. In which case we'll exit uh, our new trade in JP Morgan. We'll exit it uh, hopefully in December for a 100% return. Looking at a chart, part of our decision today as we were trying to catch the 167 trend line. So it was above its trend line, looked like it was going to bounce higher, have a little bit of protection down here at 162, have an earnings Wednesday morning. Technically, we seem to see a perfect opportunity to get into JP Morgan. So we added some pretty significant positions and accounts. Now, we also noticed a second one that's actually brought to my attention uh, from one of you guys. <laughs> brought to my attention from Dr. Gupta. And let's look at Square really quickly. Square and other financial services opportunity. This one has taken a hit from 290, it's really like 288, down to 232. So right now we have about a $56 upside opportunity on About a 56 upside opportunity on Square. Lower trend line is still intact. Might come and test it. That's what we're looking for. But right now, it might be an easy opportunity to get into Square in 2023 and look for a 56 upside opportunity. If I was going to be looking at Square and that upside opportunity, there are a couple ways you could do it. It wouldn't be a bad idea to go ahead and to purchase uh, the stock. Go ahead and purchase the stock, add a, I don't know, add a, a November, long put maybe a december short call but i would be looking at an opportunity in square just a little bit different if i was looking at a square position i'd probably go back out to january 23 or june 23 let's see which one offers maybe a uh, a better price point for us but I would be looking for 232. I would probably be looking for a 240. And I can't afford that many contracts. Let me do it as one contract. We know it's been up to 290. Here's where I would be looking, you know what, 288, 290. Yeah, that would work. $50 of upside opportunity at a $16.20 to 25 cent cost basis. 
allowing for square to do nothing but get back up to the highs that it was at a couple months ago. That's all we're doing. This could be a pretty neat order to get into if square might just fall down just so oh, a little bit more, right? That's the hope. If square could just fall down just a smidget more, we might have a pretty good opportunity in square to get a couple hundred percent return, take our $16.20 and turn it into a, uh, a $50 return. Would we get the full $50 by the end of the year? No, because there's going to be some time value. But what an amazing opportunity for a relatively cheap price to get into Square, another financial, and try to take advantage of a rising interest rate environment. It's funny because I might also stick in a 300 on here. For an extra $2.50, you can make 10 more dollars of profit. And that's at 18.72 to make $60. Percentages are pretty close, but pretty neat opportunity. If you're uncertain, you could go out just a little bit farther. Going out a little bit farther for almost exactly the same price, pretty amazing opportunity here. Pretty amazing opportunity to go out for the same price. Maybe even if I just stuck this back down to the 290, 1647 and versus 1620, boy, I'd be going out to June. The way the numbers work out today, six more months for 27 cents or so, kind of a no-brainer, right? Maybe 30 cents more, five cents for six more months. This is what I'd be looking for. Let's take a quick look at the Delta, though. We'd be making on this opportunity. 57 cents on the dollar minus 41 cents. We'd only be making about 16 cents on the dollar for a January 23. Now, of course, these are going to change. If this goes up to 260, all of a sudden we're making 71 cents instead of 57. So there is some opportunity there. Let's take a quick look at the deltas on the January. 59 cents for 43. You actually make 17 cents right here. If we went to the 290s at 45, we'd make 14 cents. Again, the June 23s seem to be outweighing the other opportunities for the stock. But pretty neat to have an opportunity in financials right now to make a killing. So I'd be looking at a square, June 23, uh, 240, 300. Well, actually, I'd probably go at 290. I want to be a little bit cheaper. 290, leap. Bull call for spending no more than sixteen dollars and fifty cents. Trying to make fifty. And the neat part about it is I would get out when the stock. reaches 288-ish. 
And there we go. Uh, I know Keith showed you last week a little bit about uh, when things get tough, you can either quit and be done, or you can choose to not ever give up. Uh, I kind of chuckle because, boy, ARC Innovations, 130 million down to less than 110 million. Uh, this is just the dollar price. That's basically a $130 billion company. But off 31% off their 52-week lows, down 11% for the year. And nothing to show for it other than she, would, she didn't guess right for her stocks. People ask me all the time, why do you do what you do? Again, we mentioned it last week. We're going to stick with our process and our methodology because it has proven to be the best way to invest in the stock market since the inception of options. It's what we do, and we feel we do it very well. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not disappointed with some of the returns that we're at right now. But the year is not over. We've done a good job of adding some shares and lowering cost basis. We're going to let the year play out and see if we can end up in the position that we think we can be in. I wish I could guarantee you everything we do. But unfortunately, I can't. It wouldn't be right. It doesn't work. But something else that we do is very interesting. In fact, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to run down to it right now. Something that we do. Flat fee models can keep clients around longer. RI execs. So it's pretty interesting because what we do is we charge an asset under management flat fee. We uh, we don't charge commissions. We don't do two and 20. We're not uh, trying to hide what, what we're charging people or what we're making. And the better you do, the better we do. It's critical for advisors to have simple fee structures to be able to explain them well to clients, said Jen Anderson, head of advisor engagement at Hightower Advisors. Most clients, regular advisors, don't know what they're being charged. According to a study released this year by the State Street Global Advisors, for example, 60% of investors who work with advisors that State Street surveyed incorrectly believe that the fund fees are included in the fees they pay an advisor or an investment platform. So what are we trying to say here? Hey, the fees that are charged to be in a mutual fund aren't included in the 1% and then the platform fees that are involved with trading in the stock market. In fact, it was unbelievable that only 24% of us, of me, of advised investors, of people who work in the industry, completely understand the concept of an expense ratio. I really put this in here to help you guys know everything that we've been telling you is starting to take root and people that are realizing that the stated returns on funds, mutual funds, are not what you receive in your portfolio. And they're getting fed up with it. This is a very interesting article to see a leveling of fees and assets under management. Basically, what we've done at Hurley Investments is what most recently you see Fisher Investments. If your portfolio goes up, our fees go up. 
Now, not by a ton. I mean, geez, on $100,000, we make like $216 a month on $100,000. If that $100,000 goes up to $150,000, we'll make $324 a month on your $150,000. We're not gouging you guys for money. In fact, a lot of you, I wait till we've got a 5% return before we start charging you anything. We're going to give you two years of our fees for free before we start charging. If your portfolio goes up, our fees go up. Again, if you go from $100 to $150,000, you make 50 grand. Our fees go up $108 a month. That's it. If your portfolio goes down, our fees go down. And we don't make as much. It's pretty interesting on what we get to do and what we get to do for you. I love being a registered investment advisor. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to put this in here. I love being a registered investment advisor. Because I get to help people the same way my portfolio is structured using the same methodology, methodology, and making the same returns they do. You want the most important part? I am no longer afraid of market crashes. Like we had last year, being down 28 to 34%. We're not afraid of a 2008 because we do something that protects downside market movement and the best part about it I can be honest in what we charge without hiding commissions fees and other incentives that's why we do what we do we do what we do for that reason alone and it's pretty neat because i've got keeve on board i've worked with uh with a couple other advisors we absolutely love what we do all right going over a little bit of stuff here for you big picture wave inflation is a monetary problem in the making plain and simple the Fed to handle inflation will have to raise rates quicker. Please go through. I've got a couple articles on inflation, which basically is saying the distorted view right now of what's having to be paid for unskilled labor or low skilled labor will cause significant price increases in the everyday products that we buy. Right now, wage labor is ridiculously high and is, is causing distortions and will continue to cause distortions in, in the pricing of uh, products we buy because companies are overpaying right now for unskilled 
for no skilled and for low skilled labor. It's something that we're going to have to pay attention to here in the near future and definitely expect some interest rate hikes in the very, very near future. Uh, someone made a comment and I forgot, so let me get back to that comment. My concern with tech is the super high PE on the long run is not sustainable. So yes, if you're investing in high PE tech companies, uh, I'm going to scratch my head because, of course, a super high PE is not only unsustainable, it's ridiculous. Hence, we're not into, I don't know, let's, let's say something like Amazon, <laughs> um, some of the ones. I mean, we're in Apple, relatively low PE. Baidu, relatively low PE. Micron is a little high. A little different story there. But yes, you should not be investing in tech with the high PEs because it's not going to suit you well in the long run. No questions asked there. Um, but pretty interesting. Take some time to look at labor. Take some time to see how much wage pressure is going to affect certain companies. Um, all right, I'm gonna just move on down. We have a bearish Dow Jones Industrial Market. Let me get our picture in here. If we're to take a look at it, we are looking for a bounce, but bearish below the median line in no man's land below the 50 and the 200. I still like the 200 day moving average in a bullish movement. Technically bearish and almost down here looking for that bounce. Oh, we have the Williams percent R, which is actually a medium statistics. Big money should be putting some new money to work here in the relatively near future. But yes, we are still bearish on the Dan Jones Industrial Average. We take a quick peek at the S&P 500. Much the same. In fact, we're actually still bearish, but closer to the 30 oversold line. In no man's land, but still holding the pivot point. Definitely bearish on the MACD, way low to the over. Uh, sold and we are oversold in the ones percent R. I would expect a bounce back on the S and P in the very near future. But that index is still bearish. And if we go ahead and insert in here my last one, the Nasdaq. NASDAQ actually looks the most bearish out of all of them. We are already touching that overbought where we're 1.61 points away from it. Below the pivot point, testing the S1 support level in no man's land, but closer to the 200 day than the 50 day. Definitely already overbought, or excuse me, oversold, which means we should expect some movement higher in the near future. Um, if someone just recently asked me, well, Kevin, if you're expecting a bounce in the near future, why are you saying a negative 2.5% October? Well, because October is usually a pretty volatile month, and even with some good earnings, you typically don't see that start to run higher until the end of October. The run doesn't start till the middle to the end of October and start to go higher. I'm expecting a, a rather low month. Earnings, we're starting our financial week. First one of three, BlackRock, Delta Airlines, JP Morgan. On Wednesday, Thursday, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, United Healthcare, Walgreens, Boots Alliance, Wells Fargo. 
Alcoa, double A there, Alcoa, technically the start of earnings season. So on Thursday for the next six weeks, we should have roughly 83 to 86% of the S&P 500 companies will report. Uh, Bank of America on Thursday before the market opens and U.S. Bank Corp on Thursday. Schwab and Goldman Sachs on Friday. We'll probably start to see some retail next week as well as more banks go through next week. Economic reports, we have the JOLTS and the NIFB Small Business Optimism reports tomorrow. Neither one are market movers. CPIs on Wednesday, PPIs on Thursday. Really, retail sales is the only market mover that we're looking at for this week. Retail sales numbers are going to be important, and we have a little bit of a conflict. Our retail sales number right here is expected to be a negative 0 0.3. But if you take out the automobiles, we're expecting to have a 0 0.4. So it's mixed. A negative on the retail sales as a whole. If you if you take out uh, automobiles, we actually should show a positive. What it really comes down to is do we have the bottlenecks on, on the products that products are no longer available? Uh, I don't see it yet. Everything I want to buy, I can still buy right now, except for a freaking AC unit and a new deep freezer. Other than that, anything else I want to buy right now, I can buy. Uh, I really didn't look internationally. Everything seems to be run by the U.S. right now. So uh, I didn't look for international movement happening here. I'm more focusing on uh, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America this week. With that said, we do have the monthly options expiration on Friday. So monthly options expiration on Friday. All right, what else do I have for you guys? Uh, still, our, our earnings, here we go. Uh, I I'm going to update that as we need to. Wish Visa would move higher. Uh, China stock surged despite a four five hundred thirty-four U.S. dollar million dollar antitrust fine sought on the food delivery giant Metuen. Uh, Alibaba got served with the fine, but pretty neat that uh, China tech stocks moved today. In fact, uh, Baidu moved, and it's almost as if right now we we cannot worry about Chinese stocks anymore with the Chinese government going after them. Pretty neat to say that we uh, that we look like we're gonna be okay in China. And it's time to see some of those companies get to rebound. I found an interesting article about Disney sh streaming, puts ESPN in an awkward position of clinging to uh, News Now, sports. Pretty amazing though, most people, I think out of all the opera, let's say this, most people don't wanna watch sports after it's occurred. We're okay missing a whole season of our, our favorite shows, but the sports we wanna watch live, it has, as they call it here, a clinging to the past type of mentality. It will be interesting to see if more people are going to watch streaming services on their small devices as they're happening. I do own ESPN Plus. Uh, I do it in conjunction with Hulu and Disney for the Disney package. I'm not sure the ESPN Plus is worth it. I don't get enough right now for it that it makes it worthwhile for me. I'm not sure if streaming at ESPN, I definitely wouldn't pay $30 a month for streaming for, for ESPN. Not worth it. Tech whistleblower, sir. Having a moment, a woman who's been there has found a new way to help. Uh, let me go on record to say 
if you are a female and you are a whistleblower, um, the sexist mentality of females in corporate America significantly hurts the female whistleblowers and it's not right. It shouldn't matter if you're a male or a female, if you see something that's inappropriate or not being done correctly, uh, you should have the right to be a whistleblower and you should be, you should have the right to, what is it, 30% of the fine that the company pays. I found it very interesting as I read the article that I felt if you are a female or a woman whistleblower, you have a significantly harder opportunity to prove your case as well as get your reward for finding something that's been done wrong over a male. Now, the sexism is, is exacerbated and ridiculous in this one area. Um, it's bothersome that a female's point of view on something a company is doing wrong is not seen equal to a male's and that the, the females seem to have a harder time of proving their case and getting what's due them for their whistleblower's claim or their or for, for really going out on, on the limb and being willing to be a whistleblower. Um, the article doesn't exactly say that, but the claims of uh, dis discrimination and retaliation against women is significantly higher than men. And as I read through this, uh, it, it pissed me off. It bugged me to see that uh, once again, and I'm not sure it's fair to say that, but once again or in, a whistleblower stance, the woman is not treated the same way as a male, and it's not right. Uh, start holiday shopping now. There are some goods that may be running out of stock. We might see a significantly uh, huge uptick as people are worried about supply chains and start to purchase Christmas gifts immediately just something to be paying attention to. Uh, they think food, car and beverages, iPhones, electronics, toys, Christmas decorations maybe hit the most. Sports and shoes, autos. Uh, cotton price at a 10-year high. I just found interesting that uh, pay attention to clothing this year, but do pay attention to cotton. Cotton prices are higher, which means retail prices will be higher for clothing. Uh, here's the flat fee model. Do spend your time on this. And last but not least, um, I enjoy paying attention to, to the fraud to warn you guys of it. Um, yet again, some people that have had some ridiculous returns did so using fraud and people lost ridiculous amounts of money. CNBC in the last hour with Shepard Stern uh, talked about Bitcoin and how many millions of dollars in Bitcoins people are losing through Coinbase. Guys, you gotta be smart. You gotta be smart in your alternative investments and what you're looking for. You've got to understand that if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. So it's something, in my opinion, you should probably be staying away from. With that said, what questions do you guys have for me? Are there any questions I can answer for you guys in regards to anything market related? Uh, any questions that you guys have that maybe I have missed or have been unable to answer uh, due to my travels last week. Uh, I'm going to answer the first question up front. And it was sent to me via email. Why aren't you currently 
investing in cryptocurrency. And it really comes down to, to one thing. Um, because they are proven to be um because they're proven to be unsecured currency slash investments there's no way to secure your investment there uh i'm not interested in gambling with your money if if Millions of dollars can disappear out of Coinbase and they've got no liability and people aren't getting their money back. You have not asked me to invest your money to gamble it. For that reason, as soon as I start to look at cryptocurrency and I want to invest a little bit in it, uh, I'm slapped back to reality and you wouldn't hire me to go take your money to Vegas. And right now the odds are exactly the same for you in cryptocurrency. So I don't do it. Uh, I haven't been hired to gamble your money, nor would I, nor am I doing any of my own money into it. Uh, I was just about going to, and I can't pull the trigger, especially if you see some of the newer problems that are going on with cryptocurrency. Just can't do it. All right, we had another question, looks like, that came in. Do you think Texas taking around $58 billion of bond underwriting from J.P. Morgan obviously affect J.P. Morgan? Um, so, no. Let me put it this way. JP Morgan can make more money outside of bonds than it can by by doing bonds. Now, of course, they get you know 58 billion to invest. They got to pay a low interest. Um, the question is, can JP Morgan make 58 billion dollars more? If could JP Morgan make more money with that 58 billion dollars? versus not having it from the state of Texas. And my comment is that uh, that's such a drop in the bucket that, that I don't see JP Morgan taking a huge hit because they're no longer gonna take money from states that are pro-gun. Um, I bet you there's some back doors there that even though they say they're not taking that money, they're finding other ways to take that money. So I would not think that really, I don't think a $58 billion investment for JP Morgan into bonds makes much of a profit. And I wouldn't think that, uh, I don't know, there's, There's pros and cons to both sides of it. But when you outright have a loss of $6 billion that just disappears versus, what, a, a quarter of a percent that they pay out in bonds or a half a percent on bonds on a yearly basis on $58 billion, um, that's such a small drop in a bucket for their revenue, it won't affect them overall. Plus, they'll just loan that money out to a higher rate, um, I don't know, uh, asset-backed real estate project, something different like that. Uh, 
Good question. Are there any other questions you guys have? As you heard me stumble my way through JP Morgan and companies now taking a political stance on how they're making their money. In fact, it's kind of funny because sometime back, if you remember, there were a lot of green funds that were created. You know, hey, we're going to be energy efficient and we're going to invest in only green companies. And you can see how well that turned out, right? That was a quick fad that came and went ridiculously quickly. And a lot of those green funds weren't really green funds and they weren't making any money. So pretty interesting to hear. Uh, Keeve, Keeve is doing pretty good fighting COVID. Kind of a worse day for him, but in all honesty, hasn't affected his breathing. Uh, he does have a cold. He does feel ridiculously weak. Uh, I I was willing to arm wrestle him, and I think I gave him 10 to 1 odds that uh, I said, Keeve, I'll arm wrestle you, and if you beat me, I'll pay you 10 times your salary. And if uh, I beat you, I'll only pay you half. And he wouldn't take me up on that offer. So he is feeling a little bit weak, but as of right now, it is not uh, dangerous or life-threatening for Keeve or his family. But boy, um, he's a trooper. I, I slept through it all days long, and he's still been available for phone calls. He's been calling me, and uh, he's really doing quite well. So I will pass on. I'll let him know that you guys asked about him. Uh, any other questions you guys have that I can answer for you? If not, we'll get this posted. I apologize. I was a little late in posting Keeves last week, but uh, I did want to introduce you to, hey, we see some new areas. We see where money's going to. We're going to move some of those into finances. We're going to put more of your money into cash through the end of the year, trying to get it out by the end of the year for a nice profit. Uh, 90 leap calls on JP Morgan went into positions today. All right, guys. Hey, have a good night. Appreciate you being here. Uh, we will see you Thursday morning to update you. and We'll probably be looking at what we might do for Square and a Square opportunity, another financial. We'll go through positions we'd be on there, but I think I gave you a good hint. If you look at Square, a couple more dollars down, another 4 to $5 down, a 240 290 a 240 300 June 2023 might be a really, really good opportunity for accounts to take advantage of financials. Have a good evening. Appreciate you guys being here. And we look forward to seeing you Thursday morning. Good night.